Good morning or <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, so, my pre this is the second talk. Uh, the, uh, the, I will shortly remind you what was the what I was talking uh, a week ago. However, the previous talk will be accessible on our YouTube channel within one or two months, something like that. So I was talking about space and space-time and uh, I was trying to convince you, ah, by the way, I brought the Aristotle uh, book, Physics, which uh, is the origin of, of the very notion of physics, Physica, because already Aristotle, 300 uh, before our year, uh, tried to understand the notion of the, of the space, and he, roughly speaking, was convinced that the space is a collection of all space points, and the space point is a place where something may happen. Now, later on, I try to convince you that this Aristotelian point of view is no longer compatible with what we know about astronomy and so on and so on. So the space-time in Aristotelian uh, philosophy splits into two completely separate structures, namely a space, let me call it X, and a time axis. And whenever something happens, so first of all, we know where does it happen, so the, at this place, and at which time. So mathematically speaking, Aristotelian space-time was a Cartesian product. Yeah? Every uh, event, physical event, was a pair. Uh, time when it happened and a place where it happened. But then I tried to convince you that the very notion of, of space has no meaning in modern understanding of uh, our surrounding universe, even if we don't understand completely the global structure of the universe, but already what we understand roughly, namely the structure of our solar system, is incompatible with that. Why? Because we, in this philosophy, the notion of the rest is um, absolute. What is a body is in, uh, at the rest where it still remains at the same point. And we know that from the point of view of space-time, there is no absolute rest. The rest is always um, relative uh, notion. <laughs> In this philosophy, it was, we were able to fix a specific space point, point just planting a, a benchmark, a geographical benchmark, which we meet uh, in wood for instance, we have those benchmarks, they correspond to different points on the, on the uh, geodesic map. However, we know that um, continents move, therefore we cannot claim that, the, that our benchmark is at rest because with respect to American or Australian benchmarks, 
they move because we are able now to measure the distance with accuracy to centimeters. And we know that um, continents move. Of course, if we go further, if we consider the fact that the uh, Earth itself moves, then we are unable to plant a benchmark, a geodesical benchmark in space-time. Yeah? Okay. On the Earth, yes, but this benchmark moves. Therefore, the very notion of space has no meaning. Whether this philosophy is better on the other one is, namely the philosophy of Newton and Galilei is better, is not was not decided by just philosophical arguments, but by practical uh, arguments, namely the uh, British fleet using this new philosophy, new geography and so on, were able to conquer various continents and so on and so on because the navigation based on, on the Copernicus, Galilei, Newtonian philosophy was more accurate. Yeah, so this is the decisive argument, in my opinion. So what is this um, philosophy? So this is Aristotle, and this is, of course, Copernicus is very fundamental, but the elaboration, the pre uh, precise elaboration of this mathematical uh, structure of space-time is due to Newton, although Galilei has to be mentioned, Galileo has to be mentioned there because they were not so distant in time. Newton was younger, however, the uh, Galileo experiments were fundamental. So, in this picture, there is no space, no space. There is space-time, which means no... Uh, so, what is space-time? It is again a collection of points, and a point is a, an event, which means not only the place, but also something what happened. And now this space-time has such a structure that it is a collection of Uh, events which occur at the same time. So somewhere here is a time axis, but the events are uh, points, the symbolical points which are here. So whenever we have an event, we know when did it happen, but we cannot say at which place it did happen. Why? Because if we have two events which happened at different times, there is always a, an observer, or there might be an observer, who can legitimately claim that these two events happened at the same time. Uh, point. Because there is always, uh, because he may claim, oh, I was uh, a witness, a witness of this event and also a witness of uh, this event. And because I am not moving, I am not moving. So this means that those two events happened where I am and I am not moving. But of course everything is relative because another 
the observer can say, no, 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 I am moving. You are, uh, I am, uh, sorry, I am at rest and you are moving. Therefore, the, the motion is a relative uh, structure. So we may say that Newtonian Galilean uh, theory was the first relativity, theory of relativity with respect to Aristotle because the motion which was believed by Aristotle to be something absolute, it is now uh, relative. Okay, then I was trying to introduce a mathematical, a mathematical structure which is used for both Aristotle and Newton Galileo. Namely, as you remember, this space, the notion of a space, was later, 100 years later, roughly speaking, elaborated by Euclid. And it gave the notion of Euclidean geometry. And I, in 19th century, this Euclidean geometry was somehow analyzed from different point of view. And I want to show you the uh, Euclidean, geo to present you the Euclidean geometry from the modern point of view. Okay, so Euclidean geometry, which was presented in a completely different way more than 2,000 years ago. Now we understand Euclidean geometry as a Euclidean geometry is a marriage of two different structures, affine plus metric. What is affine is everything which does not need measures, but only a parallel transport. And what is metric is everything which needs measures. So for instance, when we have, when we speak, when Euclid speaks about straight lines, so straight line is a purely affine notion, whereas a circle is metric because a circle is a collection of points which uh, have the same distance to, a, to the center. And now I want to, so I already did last time, but I will repeat main points. What is a fine? A fine structure is a triple. A fine structure is a triple. First of all, it is a space, which means a collection of points, a collection of points. Then it is a vector space. This is a notion which is new because it was conceived in 19th century vector space and a, a, a structure which I called plus and with a dot because this is not a plus as addition of vectors. It is an addition of a vector to a point. Okay, so this is collection, collection of points. This is just a vector space. So when we 
think about vector space, we have already a lot of, of uh, apparatus which is ready, for instance, vector space has a dimensionality. Yeah, vector space. We know what what is the basis of a vector space. Then we have that in vector space we have two operations, namely addition of vectors and multiplication by a number. By the way, vector space must be to be. Precise, I must say, vector space over a um, body, algebraic body. In physics, we mostly use either real numbers, body of real numbers, of, or uh, complex numbers. I will mainly um, use real, but I will not use any exotic uh, algebraic bodies, but mathematicians very often analyze different. So vector, when, whenever I use the notion of vector space, I have to say whether it is real vector space or complex vector space. Real vector space is simpler because multiplication by a number means change the, uh, means, means rescale a vector, yeah? Make it twice as big or change the direction. Uh, in complex case, it is more difficult because we also change the phases, but Complex vector spaces are important in quantum physics. And this is an operation where to each point and each vector assigns another point. Yeah. So we may say that those vectors are treated as transformations of A. Yeah? Because whenever we have uh, a point and a vector, so we say, ah, B has been uh, shifted from A by a vector V. And now, this operation, so V is, a, uh, is treated as a group of transformations of A. Yeah. Sometimes this group is called translation. Translation. Straight translation group. And in order, but not any such a mapping is good. A fine if a fine space is such that um, certain the axioms are fulfilled. So first axioms, axioms, that if I translate a point V by a vector V, and then the result I translate by another vector, say W, so it is the same as the vector A translated by their sum. Of course, you may say that 
I should probably, many authors, especially physicists, would not uh, discriminate between this plus and that plus, but just to be, yeah, because this plus addition means to add two vectors. Yeah, there are vectors, and we know in a vector space we have a no, uh, the operation of addition of vectors. Whereas this plus is something else. It is a translation of a point by a vector. Translation of a point A by a vector, and then translation by another vector. So this is very important axiom. And last time I forgot to add another. Uh, why did I forgot? Because very often this axiom is formulated also in a different way that zero, because in every vector space you have zero, a privileged, yeah, in ve vector space you have a, a specific vector which is a, a, a neutral a neutral point of this addition, yeah? So this is again A. So this simply means that uh, the mapping from this vector space to the group of transformations is a, a homomorphism of, of mapping. Okay, I will not go very much into details because just from these two we may derive more uh, properties which are probably obvious for a physicist, yeah, so, uh, but I'm not going too much into details. So this is affine geometry. And in affine geometry you are unable to say what does it mean the length, the distance. So now I will, I'm going to talk about metric. The metric structure was also somehow invented or cod codified by those brilliant mostly British uh, mathematicians in mid 19th century, so the metric space. Metric space, to add metric properties to, to affine, it is sufficient to uh, define a scalar product. So whenever you have two vectors, you have something which we call scalar product, and it is a number. In the real case, it is just a real number. In, in complex case, it is a complex number. <laughs> and This object, this is a mapping, just a function of two parameters. I very much like to think about it as a black box with two slots. You put one vector into one slot, you put another vector into another slot, something comes, and as an outcome, we obtain a number. And now this black box has to fulfill few properties. First of all, symmetry. Which simply means that Vw is the same like V, uh, like Wv. So it is symmetric. But you, 
bilinear, which means that if I fix uh, the uh, what I put into uh, one slot, then with respect to what I put in the, into another slot, it is linear. Now, if I put here a sum, I obtain the sum in, in so, bilinear. Of course, bilinear, because it is linear here, then due to symmetry, it is also linear with respect to the other slot. And positivity. Which simply means that if I calculate the uh, scalar product of any vector with himself, it is non-negative. And I have divided very often this two properties, I cited together, but I prefer to divide them because strictly positive. What does it mean, strictly positive? This means that if if it happens that this is zero, then V is equal to zero. And of course, this zero is, and that one are different things because this is a number, this is a vector zero. Okay, so and now it turns out that these two uh, structures capture entirely the Euclidean geometry and for instance, what, what is a, a straight line? So, for instance, straight line So it is a collection of a point, of points A shifted by a multiple of V such that T belongs to. So this collection maybe is a straight line whose tangent vector is V, and it passes through a point A. And now what is a parallel line? Just put another point here without changing the vectors, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the entire Euclidean geometry is captured here. So what is a circle? Circle is simply a point and co the collection of points such that they are um, maybe obtained by shifting a given point, which is a circle, such that the length of this point is equal R, yeah? So this is a, a circle, which is centered at A of radius R, yeah? And so on and so on, where I forgot you to tell that the length of a vector is nothing by the square root of of that. Now I, I, I was also talking about uh, the polarization 
and so on and so on, but I will not come back to that. This polarization formula is very important, but let me skip it now. And let me come back to this Galileo model of So for instance, Euclidean geometry, three-dimensional Euclidean geometry, which was a model for the Aristotle space, is an example of such a structure, a finite metric. But Newton Galileo. So Newton Galileo model or rather Galileo-Newton model of space-time <laughs> according to Galileo-Newton. So first, it is an affine space. Again, it is an affine space. It is very difficult. Let me call I have a tendency to call it M <laughs> because the goal of my talk will be general relativity and space-time in our present understanding is Minkowski, therefore I, I spontaneously use the letter M for space-time, but of course it's Newton's time, nobody has heard about Minkowski. Okay, so this is a collection of points. Everything which I, I uh, was, which was written in, at this blackboard. So w whenever we have a point, Then we have a collection of vectors, and we know what does it mean shift the entire space-time, which means all possible events, by a vector. Yeah? So let me call this M, and this is a no, sorry, sorry, excuse me. I must be precise. So it is a triple. So this is a collection of points. This is a vector space. And of course, this translation operation. So this is collection of points. of space-time points, yeah, of yeah. in other words of of events, yeah. Of course what is event I'm not going to such details because from for a cosmologue, cosmologist, uh, for example, and even like a, a eruption of a vulcan, of a volcano is just an event. 
But for a geologist, this event is, com is very big one, and there are many, many small events which, which are there. So it depends on which scale we are using. But roughly speaking, we understand. Collection of events. Now this is uh, vectors. Space-time vectors, and this is and, this. and unlike in uh, in uh, um, Aristotle geometry, there is no metric there. There is no space-time metric, but. The fundamental thing is that this stratification, this stratification. <laughs> and this stratification means that all those points are, can be combined into those smaller collections of events which occur at the same at the same time so how do we describe mathematically this structure this simply means that whenever we have a a vector there is a number which tells what is the time difference between the beginning and the end of these vectors. What does it mean? It simply means that there is a covector. This covector um, is a co a vector this covector very often mathematically it is a it is a nonsense but uh, we uh, very often call it dt. <coughs> what does it mean, this, this covector? Uh, are you trained in, uh, in uh, uh, algebra uh, to such an extent that you know what is covector? Yes. Yeah. So this is an element of M star. M star is a collection of linear functions on M. Now, so there is one of them. Yeah. And uh, a vector is called Uh, space like if and only if uh, this privileged covector dt when calculated on v is equal to zero. M-S is just a subspace, a vector, because the, um, it is a subspace, linear subspace. Everything is linear because this is just a linear algebra. And this is four-dimensional.
And of course, uh, kernel of a single non-zero dt is has a co-dimensionality equal one. Therefore, it, this is three-dimensional. Oh. And whenever we take an event A, then A plus V such that V is an S is precisely a uh, Three uh, and Euclidean space. What does it mean? So, so this is a third axiom. Of course, it is an affine space because a subspace. Yeah. So this is a three-dimensional <coughs> Euclidean space. Of course, it is affine because uh, such a linear subspace of an affine space, it is again an affine space, so there is no problem. But what is new in uh, axiom three with respect to previous axioms, that it is also a metric space. What does it mean? That there is a uh, scalar product, but only only for uh, V and V belonging to this space like points. So what is very important that we are in, in uh, Newtonian physics, we are unable to measure a distance between two different events if they are not distant by a space-like vector, which means that if they are not uh, if they didn't happen at the same time. There is a nonsense in Newtonian physics to ask what is the distance between these two events. Only when we have two events which occur at the same time, we are able to measure the <coughs> And this is this, this story, you, you see, I don't know, uh, I'm sure you have read some books in uh, general relativity and how old books did you read? Because the first books in general relativity were full of those, of those uh, roads and um, watches and so on, but th those uh, elastic rods, this is a science fiction. It has nothing to do. We are unable to, uh, uh, to measure a distance between uh, us and, for instance, uh, other star using those rods. Because how do we Proceed. This is a complete science fiction. Therefore, we should forget about rods. There will be no rods, but those rods which existed in Newtonian and Galilean uh, physics, namely, they were used to measure the distance between mutually contemporary events. 
But in modern physics, no such rods. If we are here and here is another star, there, there are no rods which we may use to measure the distance. To measure the distance between us and another galaxy or another, another star, we use light. And this is going to be a, a subject of my talk. But forget about rods. <laughs> But in Newtonian Galilean physics, there are those rods. Namely, whenever we have two different <coughs> events, but mutually contemporary, they happen at the same time, then we, it is uh, legitimate to ask how distant are those. However, if one of them is even one second later, then already the distance between those two events has no sense. So from this point of view, it is something somehow su suspectable, because <laughs> if uh, this notion of a distance is, such, is so much uh, non-continuous, it means that there is something, because in physics it is strange that the very notion of the distance is, in a sense, non-continuous. Yeah? This time lapse can be very short, just one second, and immediately it destroys the possibility to measure the distance. Why? because there is always a, an observer who may pass through this event and that event. And he may claim that for him these, are, uh, these events happened at the same uh, place. Therefore, for him, the distance between those two events is zero, is strictly zero. And when this lapse of time tends to zero, then immediately the situation jumps and is completely different. So we already see that something is a bit suspicious. In anyhow, it is the situation in Newtonian geometry, in Newtonian physics. And we should be aware of that. OK. So in Newtonian physics, we are able to calculate distance only for contemporary events, which means that we are able to calculate this uh, length and also the scalar product only for two vectors which uh, belong to this three-dimensional subspace of all possible space-time vectors. But Newton still keeps the affine structure of of the of space time so the affine structure is there but metric structure only of each such space separately now let me observe that this that philosophically this structure is very strange because how do we check whether two distant events are contemporary, mutually contemporary, or no. It is very hard to believe. How Suppose something happens here. For instance, you remember a few years ago there was a huge eruption of, of a volcano uh, in Iceland. 
So this was a very important event. We may perfectly imagine that there is a planet which is distant by, I don't know, uh, one billion uh, light years. And there is another eruption on that, on that uh, planet. And how do we check whether those two events are contemporary or no? We have absolutely no... I will discuss further this, the notion of, of contemporaneity. However, observe that philosophically this is a very suspicious because if we believe in this structure of space-time, then we must say that practically there is no way to check whether those two very distant events are contemporary, mutually contemporary or no. So we must believe that for any instant of time, there exists somewhere a book where all those events have been listed, even if we do not have any access to that book, but this book does exist. So for each instant of time, there is a book somewhere where all those events which occurred at the time t have been listed. However, this belief has nothing to do with our practical action. We, as physicists, we have no access to, to such a book. Therefore, from this point of view, we have already uh, to admit that this structure is very difficult. And I claim that the Einsteinian model of space-time is much simpler. Okay. Uh, however, there is another, another. There is absolutely, I will tell absolute time. Of course, in any textbook about physics, you find that there is an absolute time, but now, now I want to give a specific mathematical uh, meaning to this notion, which I put it to, into quotation mark. Okay, so whenever for uh, a pair A, B of events, There uh, is a lapse of, lapse of time. A lapse of time, it is how much time elapsed between one event and another event, which is what? The A, B, is a vector, yeah? A, B is a vector, and this lapse of time, delta T, lapse of time, which let me call delta E, is nothing but the value of this privileged covector, which is there, on this vector, on this vector. Oh. And this is a number. 
So whenever we have two events, we may absolutely say what is what how much time elapsed between them, even if they are extremely distant. We are unable to calculate the distance between them, but the lapse of time is, is defined in an absolute way. So, sometime it will, the, the value of this lapse of time will be equal to zero. And we know this simply means that V belongs to this privileged subspace and MF. So if delta T is zero, it means that A and B are mutually contemporary. They happened at the same time. Okay, so this is the entire bit. And now, what is a notion of a reference frame? Reference frame. Newtonian physics, what is a reference frame? I'm discussing this structure in detail because I believe it is very important to have a clear meaning what's going on. So, uh, What is a reference frame? A reference frame is a way to come back to this previous uh, Aristotelian meaning, namely to divide everything into space and time. To be able, the, the main difference between Aristoteles and Aristotle and Newton is that those two spaces at different, at two different times are simply different. There is no unique identification. Uh, uh, as I already mentioned many times here, if I have an event which happened here and an event which happened at different time, the question, was it at the same time, is stupid. It is meaningless. There is no intelligent answer for, for this question. Whereas in uh, Aristotelian physics, where we had an earth under our feet, it was a legitimate question. Yeah? Every revolution, also in physics, is not total. Einstein was unable to change completely the point of view. Therefore, this notion of time and space was important and for that purpose he was he used a reference frame a notion of a reference frame so a reference frame to construct a reference frame take a vector which is not space like take a vector B, which does not belong to this subspace of privileged 
space-like vectors. This means that this privileged God-given covector is not zero. Is not, but if it, no, it is not zero, then we may choose it in such a way that it is, for instance, equal to one. Because it, it is, if it is two, then we divide by two. If it is minus five, then we divide this vector by, by minus five, and that's all. Yeah? So we may perfectly scale it in such a way that the value is equal to one. And now, every space-time, uh, let me call it V0, okay, just a specific, of course the choice is not unique, there are many choices. Whenever I have V0, I may add here any uh, space-like vector and it will be equally good. But just choose one of them. Every space-time vector V can be uniquely decompose namely v is equal tau times v0 plus vs such that this is already ms and this is obvious yeah do you think, is it obvious or you would prefer that I prove it? <laughs> this is just a simple, is it obvious? Okay, I will prove it. Because take D, D on V, I have chosen any space-time vector. And I will, let me define this number. And now take V minus tau V0. So if I calculate dt on that, it will be d, because of linearity, because it is a covector, therefore, it acts, acting on a sum, it gives a sum of result, dt on v. <coughs> okay, let me write it in a childish way, dt on minus tau v0. But dt on v is precisely tau. Now, because of uh, linearity, minus goes here, minus. Now, because of linearity, tau goes outside, tau times dt over v0. And this was 1, therefore it is 0, which simply means that this vector belongs to MS, is space-like. <coughs> now, so VS belongs to MS. And this is a, a unique decomposition, of course. <coughs> because it is simply given by this, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Therefore, if I have a point, a space-time point, so any any other event sometimes i say space time points but sometimes event event is just a space time point is equal to b equal a plus v well, this was this comes from the axiomatics of the affine space yeah that this shift uh, this translation by a vector form an isomorphism of, of a space they are invertible and so on and so on yeah? But V can be decomposed, yeah? So uh, A plus tau V0 plus <coughs> Vs. So, so I will group it A plus Vs plus tau of V S. So this is a point A shifted by the space time uh, space like point, therefore it is this it belongs to this three dimensional space of events which are mutually contemporary with A. Yeah? So this we may call space and here if I have a, so <laughs> finally you may say that the entire uh, information is given by a po space point let me call space point let me call it, for instance, B and time. So we are back in the no. So the collection of all points which are contemporary with A is uh, Euclidean space. Yeah? So this belongs to a three-dimensional Euclidean space. So every event B can be uniquely decomposed in such a way that the information is a, a point of the Euclidean space and the time. But of course, <laughs> this depends upon a choice of this vector V0. Yeah, this depends upon a, upon, a, uh, upon a choice of V0, and if I, no, but in any case, when we choose a reference frame, this means that we choose a vector which is not space-like. Of course, this is uh, whether we put here one or one million, it doesn't matter, yeah? Because what counts is, is only a direction. Because if uh, there is a million here, I may always divide and choose 
a bit shorter vector and everything is equivalent, only the time scale changes. So the choice of a reference frame is a choice of a vector which is not a space-like vector. <coughs> And such a choice uniquely chooses a time scale, and <coughs> we are back in this picture that space time is a Cartesian product of a time axis and a space, three dimensional Euclidean space. But of course, if we change the, the vector, there is, this splitting is different. Yeah? This splitting is absolute, according to Newton, but this splitting depends upon a choice of a... Yeah? This splitting is equally good as that one. Yeah? So assigning to an event time is absolute, assigning to an event a point of space where it did happen is not absolute, depends upon a choice of a reference. This is practically all which I had to tell you about uh, New Galileo Newton model of space-time. You see, the job of a theoretical physicist is to build models. Is to build models. Of course, every model is relatively far from the experience. For, for example, Euclidean geometry is about those triangles, about, for, for example, the Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, you understand the theorem of Pythagoras. A squared plus B square is equal C square. One of the most fundamental things. And if you take a boy who, I don't know, was born somewhere in Africa in a bush, you put him to a school after a few years of education, I may prove him this theorem. And after some reflection, he will say, ah, yes, it is true, it is true. But after all, what is it about, this theorem? Ah, you say, it is about uh, triangles. But can we check this theorem experimentally? To some extent, but not to be sure that it is precisely. We may check that, okay, with a good approximation, it is okay. But when we provide a mathematical proof, we are sure that it is just true, not approximate, but true. But you think, this is about what? What are those triangles? These are just mathematical structure which we construct in our mind. In physics, there are no triangles. Why? Because in physics there are no straight lines. Because a straight line should be infinitely thin. We are unable to draw an infinitely thin because we always use some atoms and so on, and atom has some uh, some uh, size. 
So we are unable. So it is even, we cannot even admit that we could check this theorem. But when we are thinking about those ideas which we have in mind, we are sure, in 100%, this is not approximate, this is sure. Now, we, in our mind, we may construct different things. And the physics consists, and mathematicians very often construct very abstract model of things, and they don't worry whether uh, these models correspond to anything with, which does do exist in, the, in nature. But we physicists, we are not allowed models which are too abstract. We have to check whether our model helps us to understand the real world, because this is our job. Our job is to understand the real world. Now, having told this, we must admit that our models are always a bit abstract. For instance, if we think that space-time, which we live, which we meet in everyday life or in our laboratory, fulfills all those axioms, then of course we are unable to check everything. Because, for example, these models admit that we may infinitely many divide any small uh, interval. I remember I was many times working as a volunteer in our uh, in our uh, commune to help children who has problems, school problems. And I was just doing, uh, helped the children. There was a boy, uh, something like 12, maybe 13 years old, and I did with him some exercises in mathematics and so on. Eh? And for instance, he had some pro to solve some problems in physics, so I helped him. And he was supposed to learn the terminology, physical terminology. What is meter? A meter is something like that. A centimeter is something like that. A millimeter, uh, something like that. Very good. And then uh, there was a micrometer, a micrometer. What is micrometer? Uh, very simple, you just take a millimeter and you divide it into uh, 10, uh, sorry, the thousand equal parts. And he said, ah, are we able to divide millimeter into thousand parts? And it was very intelligent remark, I believe. Very intelligent. Because when adopting all, the, all, all this, we um, suppose that we may always divide. If you give me something which is extremely small, in principle, we assume that we are able still to divide it into thousand equal parts. And if I take this one of them, it is again possible, we are again possible to divide it. Of course, practically, probably it is impossible. What we know now is that we understand microphysics, quantum physics, up to, say, 10 to, 10 to, say, minus 8 or 9 centimeters. Of course, there are those crazy uh, particle physicists who 
claim that they understand everything up to uh, Planck constant, Planck length, which is minus 40, but this is stupid. We, we don't understand. At the moment, we understand physics up to that. What is further, we don't understand well. So, maybe there is nothing like that. Maybe if we say that something is 10 to the, the, the size of an electron is around 10 to minus 13 centimeter, maybe it is stupid. Maybe it is good, maybe, maybe no. Maybe 10 to minus 13 centimeter does not exist because when we go further and further, we don't see continuum. Yeah? The continuum is, is a product of our mind. It means that at each scale, space-time looks in the same way. If you take, of course, if you take a piece of a material, it looks in a completely different way if you uh, look at it by a microscope. But the space or space-time, sometimes we believe that at any scale, it looks exactly the same way. Maybe it is true, maybe it is wrong. There have been many, recently, many attempts to, <laughs> to change this point of view. I don't know whether you have heard about the so-called uh, non-commutative geometry, uh, this is somehow related with quantum, uh, quantum uh, gravity, the attempts to, to somehow combine quanta with gravity, which as, at the moment I believe it is impossible. Maybe in the future we will be able, but at the moment it doesn't work. But some of those attempts be, be, uh, to, to quantum gravity were based on the fact that maybe in small scale the structure of universe is no longer uh, like that because if you, you take this material, it looks like a continuum uh, uh, material, continuous material. But of course, if you take a microscope, you see that it is not a continuous, there are la those lines and so on. So also those people in quantum gravity, were, they were talking about polymer structure of space-time and so on. And very interesting ideas, but at the moment, they don't work. There are attempts, but at the moment, it they are only heuristic ideas. Maybe in the future there are some um, real results in this uh, non-commutative geometry which are mathematically correct, but at, the, but at the moment they have nothing to do with physics. Uh, we'll see. Okay, so uh, what is the moral of what I told you? That constructing mathematical models is our job in physics, of course. But on one hand, those models have to be confronted with reality. If they help us to understand the real things which happen, for example, this model helped British Empire to conquer many lands, many countries, because Captain Cook was able to <coughs> navigate on uh, South Pacific with much better results than when 
people use the previous Aristotelian, Prometean uh, pictures of space-time. Yeah? Therefore, it is better. So we have to, con to confront our models with reality. But on the other hand, don't forget that our models are always contain a lot of uh, structures which have been conceived in our mind and don't expect too much, too much <laughs> reality. Okay, I believe that I will... S Wait a moment, yeah, because I did not make any breaks, yeah, so in principle, my idea is to do uh, twice 45 minutes, but... So I will stop here, and the next... You have this uh, curriculum, of course, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Have you? Is it true? I guess. Ah, yes, so, so I will have this on. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the next topic I'm going to, uh, to uh, say will be uh, wave equation or string equation. We will start with a string, also with, with uh, uh, sound propagation, and we will um, discuss symmetries because sometimes people say that the very notion of relativity is based on uh, Lorentz transformation. To some extent it is true, to some extent it is entirely false, and Lorentz, uh, Lorentz transformations have been uh, formulated by Lorentz, but uh, much later discovered by people working in elasticity as a symmetry group of, uh, of uh, wave equations. And be because every field theory, electrodynamics, gravity, and so on, is based in a sense of on a uh, wave equation, therefore, we will deeply analyze the properties of wave equations. And this will be the story during the next talk. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.